Hey, what's up, Liron here. I want to share with you three tips for improving your light and shadow pretty much immediately. Um, these are, again, take everything I say with a grain of salt, see how it works for you. I do want to present these because from my experience, they do help just as a fact with the creation of a good sense of light and shadow in depth and three dimensionality, which is, I think, something a lot of people are after. We're going to start with tip number one that you can already see by the way I'm working on the sky, and that is leaving the paper white uh, if you can and if it makes sense. And let me explain why. I just want to mention before that, if you want to use my sketch, you can find the link to it below. I will link it up with the reference photo so you can recreate the sketch and paint along with me. Now, the reason in this context of why I recommend leaving the paper white here is it allows for a larger range of values. What do I mean by that? In order to create a full sense of three dimensionality and light and shadow, um, sometimes it's required to show the lightest lights and the darkest darks. And if you can show all of them, uh, you'll get the best impression. If you're just including a part of the light and shadow scale or the value scale, if you will, um, depending on the scene, again, depending on the context, it may end up not looking three-dimensional and, and like real good light and shadow sense, uh, which is why for some scenes it makes a lot of sense to leave the paper white behind as I'm going to do around the windows as well, around the water thingy to heat them and all of that. Um, now, sometimes, and you hear me talk about it, sometimes the white stands out or sticks out not in a good way, because some paintings are so bathed in sunlight or in, in a unique atmosphere where it makes no sense to leave paper white at all. That can happen. This is not one of them, because if you look at the reference photo, there's quite a lot of white in there. Okay, so sometimes it does not make sense and I end up removing it. You will, you saw it in a video I posted. I, I'm off with the schedule, it's such a mess, but I think it's a video I already posted with the staircase. There I started with paper white and I ended up covering it with yellow just to make it all come together a little better and work well. But I guess for this painting, because we actually have a lot of white here, it makes sense to leave it behind. Sometimes it can be... A challenge to figure out what to leave behind while you're painting a wash that's drying on you. Something I'll discuss in a future video. Um, it's not that important, actually, if the flow is ruined. Flow is not a must. It's not a rule. It's not, there are no rules. Uh, but I guess that's the first uh, advice I want to give you. Now, this segues us pretty nicely with this wash into the second advice. And that would be, if you can and if it makes sense, once again, take it all. See if it works in the context of what you're working on. Uh, trying to use um, vibrant colors, especially in the first washes. Um, the reason for, especially in the first washes, is that it's very easy to dull the colors out if necessary. In fact, you will see me do some of that here. But look at the bright yellows I'm using, the very nice oranges I'm using. First of all, it's all going to dry much lighter and much more muted. That's just the nature of watercolor. You see it currently at its brightest. That's the first thing. The second thing is... It's very easy if we want to dull and mute a color later on by simply glazing over it without compromising on the value. Meaning, because this wash is so light, I could glaze over it with, let's say there's a red and, and yellow mostly. By glazing with a blue, I'll neutralize it like that very easily. And it, will, it can still stay light because watercolor is transparent, one layer over another. The blue will kill the red and yellow and it will just make it look dull. Um, which is why I think especially for the first couple of washes, getting vibrant colors can be just very useful for later on because it will help you express the feeling of light in the lights. Later on when we add the shadows, it'll be about the shadows and then and I actually have another tip coming for that too, which we'll get to in a second. So what you see me doing so far in this process to conclude and by the way, I have not mentioned this is a study for a larger piece that I hopefully will get the chance to paint someday um, <coughs> where I want to show a bit more of the details, have it a bit finer, a bit more accurate. Um, 
I think it has good potential. It's one of those things, scenes that I love. People often ask me what attracted me to paint a certain scene. For this one, it was definitely those beautiful, warm colors on the building's wall. I do intend for the colors to be more closely matched in the larger version, so you will see that nuance from a gray down to a yellow. Now, I am trying to improve a bit of that, so you see me using very wet paint, mostly water. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, allow these to move down a bit and then I'll start injecting just gray, wet and wet to gray the top of the building to show that it's, you know, kind of weathered walls. They've been through rain, they've been through a lot and you can see it right here. Uh, I find that putting this improves the lighter areas, right? The, the dichotomy or contrast is uh, is responsible for a lot of the beauty here. Uh, and off we go with starting to work on the shadows. Now I'm going to work on these shadows in a way I'm trying to develop right now, which is I am starting light. Um, gives me more time, allows me to do wet and wet slowly and gradually, allows me to play around with the shape as much as I want just to make sure it's accurate. Um, it is something I'm trying to do more and more of. Start with a lot of water, even if it's pretty dark, uh, because I find that just physics, you know, water and paint, it works a little better for my uses. Um, and we're continuing with the shadows. Now you already may notice something that hints at my fourth, my third tip. Um, so look at how I'm painting these shapes. I'm, I'm merging a lot of shapes if I can, or the shadow goes around a window and it connects down. Now I have a very orange shadow on the wall and then a bit of a cooler shadow on that other uh, mini rooftop. I don't know what to call it, this piece of, you know, it's a weird material. Some of these buildings are old, it's asbestos, which is terrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, so already you can tell, window, very cool. Shadow underneath, very warm. This brings us into tip number three. Um, if you can, and if it makes sense, once again, and if you want to, uh, gentle color variety within the shadows and temperature variety. So the reality is, if you can utilize these types of multitude of colors in the shadows, it will do something for the viewer. Now, on a very practical note, reality is, if you look at shadows, they do have colors. They're not just gray for the most part. They do have a bit of warmth in them, a bit of coolness. And by the way, here I am doing the wet and wet I told you about. If I start very wet, it will it gives me enough time to really see the, the wash drying slowly and then get to that perfect, you know, 70% uh, wet with 30% dry. Um, there's 70 more percent to go somewhere along that sweet spot that really helps uh, to do wet and wet gradually and push the values to be... Um, uh, just the right amount. Um, so going back to tip number three, whereas if you can vary especially the temperature of these um, shadows, it can go a long way because the reality is shadows are not gray. They, they reflect their environment. They're, it's a living, breathing thing and you can see it really well if you've ever done you know, professional photography or which is probably not most people, including myself, by the way, but they have these large screens. And it's very well known that you place and it changes the light on the, on the person you're taking a photo of or the subject. As soon as you bring that in, there's immediately reflected light on the person or the object. You can grab a sheet of watercolor paper and if it's a sunny day, just place it around your work desk, whatever, wherever you sit or watch this at the moment. And look at how the light changes just by having a big piece of white paper uh, and moving it around and changing the angle. You will see. And so very rarely are the shadows just boring, monotone, stale permanent colors. They tend to have a lot of variety in them. Some variety comes from the surface on which the shadow is cast. Like in this example, we have a lot of cast shadows on the building, but then we also have shadows that are so behind the window is quite dark. We have all kinds of shadows here and their colors are affected greatly by the environment. Now, one of the things I like doing is playing around gray. So imagine this very we have a we have a circle. The very center of it is a perfect gray. Okay? Now, when you push 
the curse or mouse curse or whatever it is outside the center of that circle, you end up pulling it in different directions away from the gray. Imagine these directions are yellow and blue and purple and red. So I like to play from the grays to go a bit towards the color. So it's mostly gray, but it's a gray yellow. Mostly gray, but it's a gray red. It's a gray blue, whatever it is. The way to achieve this is you can just start by mixing a gray and then add a color to it. You can start with neutral tint and add red to it. Or you can just use your three primary colors, as I often do, and have a mix where uh, one color is dominant over the others. So uh, if you were to mix blue, red, and yellow in perfect th uh, thirds, right, you'll get a gray. Uh, if you're using the primary colors that lead to that gray, you'll get some kind of a gray. But then if you add to that a bit of yellow, so you have more yellow, you'll get a grayish yellow. Uh, and that's how I like to do it. I push it in different directions. So in here, you'll recognize a bit of violet, a bit of blue, a lot of oranges and yellows. And that is another huge part um, of how you can achieve that beautiful sense of light and shadow. So we've had, just to conclude what we've had so far, we've had, by the way, this section to the right, it's really out of focus. So look at how loosely I'm painting it. Um, so we've had, you know, leaving the paper white, which was our first wash where we skipped the uh, paper white to create a, a wide range of values, starting from the lightest possible light, which is the paper, right? And then we went over to using vibrant colors, especially in the first wash, um, because that's when you can really let them shine. It's directly above the paper and it's very easy to mute if necessary. And then third was uh, a gentle color variety within the shadows. If you can pull that off, already you're setting yourself up to for success and for a good feeling of light and shadow. Now I do want to provide another piece of advice. Um, if you can look at your overall composition, that's just generally speaking, and see that things work. So for example here, what you'll notice is this entire building to the left really brings out the the building on the right. So I would say um, the I'll, I'm going to give it as a bonus tip actually. Um, so to go dark, as dark as necessary. And look at how dark I'm going there in this shadow right under there. Because if you look at it from afar, you'll notice that the again, the entire building on the left really um, touches the building on the right. The reason the building on the right looks like it pops towards us is because of the dark to the left. And all of that left building, which is significantly darker than the building, the main our main building is much darker. That immediately makes it pop just like we've seen many times with still life subjects, where you paint maybe a ball of fruit or something, you add a dark background, they immediately pop at you. Um, so that's another um, thing to pay attention to. And you will notice that the upcoming stages of the painting, the next, let's say three minutes or so, are gonna be just going over areas and darkening them. But before that, look at, I'm adding a bit of lemon yellow. It's a bit more of a uh, opaque, color uh, just to bring out some of the foliage so it's not too dark uh, adding the same kind of yellow blue uh, yellow and blue to create the greens in the background and you'll notice I carved out the shape of the windows of our light building to make them make more sense they were a little crooked they're still a little crooked these are exactly the types of things that I'll um, put more emphasis on in the larger version uh, but for this smaller version <coughs> honestly not as important um, I just try to figure out if this is gonna connect to something that looks good. Because very often you think something will look good and you end up with a very boring subject. Yeah, I think it's a matter of personal inspiration. Everyone's gonna, it's gonna be very individualistic. Everyone will have a different scene that inspires them more. Um, so now we're working on the rooftop, doing the exact same thing, darkening, mostly because these are a lot of white objects. Um, the shadows are relatively gray. There isn't too much reflected light I see here from, let's say, the rooftop or something that that creates a feel of warmth, yellowness, redness, whatever it is. Um, there are there is a bit of rust on some of the metal parts there, um, but mostly it's just a very very flat gray. So 
so far we've did a we've done a first wash, skipped the highlights, uh, did another wash of shadows and another main one establishing the big shadowy area to the left. Now we're going to finish up that layer of shadows. The next stage is going to be really pushing the darks and some of the details here. So right now, if you look at the windows, especially, um, they look quite dark. And in the context of the painting, it's quite dark. But the wall on the left or the building on the left is a little darker. In a few seconds, when we get to the windows, you'll see what it means to truly push them to be dark. So they're going to be really, really dark in some spots. And it's so important because it connects to uh, what I mentioned earlier about that full range of values. If you can, if it's possible, if it makes sense for the painting you're working on or the sketch even, um, pushing it all the way from white to black makes a lot of sense. Um, for more atmospheric scenes, what makes them... The, one of the things that makes them more atmospheric to begin with is a narrower um, range of values. When you have this scene that's directly sunlit, and I'm adding some of the drain pipes and details, when, when you have this scene that's directly hit by the sun, you get all the full range, which is why it was important for me to show. In scenes where it's foggy, misty, overcast, you usually tend to get a narrower... Um, range of values. So you don't get the lightest lights and you usually don't get the darkest darks or you get something from the middle to the dark. <coughs> and you'll notice that with, imagine a lot of the Joseph's Bookwitch paintings, which is a part of their magic is, and it's very different from Alvaro Castaner, by the way. When he does cityscapes or landscapes from afar, one of the things you'll notice, he makes a lot of use of that. So the darkest darks, Sometimes they do reach the darkest point, but usually a lot of the lightest lights aren't going to be there. I'm talking about the more atmospheric works, not the fields that are hit directly by light. More of his Venice works, sometimes some of the lighter lights are eliminated. And this is a part of what leads to the atmosphere. Uh, you have the whole idea of a, a, um, a very one very dominant hue. Sometimes it'll be yellow for fog. Sometimes it'll be gray, you know, it's those kinds of things you tend to see. So I added a few wires, rigging, stuff going all around the, the buildings. These are details just for our eyes to focus on. You see them in the reference photo. And now it's time to truly push the darks to be as dark as they need to be. Remember, a full range of value in this one, right? You can decide to narrow it, you can decide to do anything. You don't have to let the reference photo, um, you know, uh, direct you in any way that gives up control because a lot of people myself included sometimes it happens uh, you become so obsessed with what is this color what is this shape and you become a slave to it and it's not always a good idea i think to become a slave to anything that is not just your um your own artistic vision and as pure and clean as you can can do uh with that they'll be better um so slowly and gradually pushing the darks where I see them just go darker. Uh, this is especially, again, for the windows. You'll see that beautiful window to the right. As soon as I add some darker shadows to it, in a second you'll see it, um, the blue really shines. So that's another thing that um, I'm not sure exactly why, and I am e making use of wet and wet. Um, I'm not really sure why, but when you add a really dark color, it ends up being black it makes the colors that aren't black more vibrant. So you see right here, uh, this blue is very weak. It's still strong, but it's not that strong. As soon as I add the black, it looks like, like a lit blue. Just looks so good. Um, so yeah, so I had one more bonus tip and that is just, I mentioned it briefly, uh, and that is look at the overall composition. If you can find large shapes that can define the painting. In this example, it was that shadow of the entire building on the left. That's a big shape. The sky was also a big shape. We just kind of glazed over that, but that's another one. Maybe your artistic impression would say to darken the sky. That is perfectly fine. It is darker in the reference photo for sure. Darkening it will make the entire building pop a little more. And actually, looking at it now, I may just go ahead and do that and share with you the final scan um, with that added step. And that's fine. Um, I think it will just put more focus on the building. It'll be an interesting thing to test out. Now, look at how much these small details make a difference. 
in the blinds see just adding a bit of that texture tells us the story there um all of these small details you know you could stop now and the painting is pretty much done but if you see a detail there uh, and you feel like it will add go ahead and try adding it now one thing that was missing for me is i see a strong blue and i see a strong yellow i don't see a strong red here uh, which is why I decided, you'll see that in a couple of seconds, I did decide to add a bit of red there to the center of the painting. That's, again, very much a me thing. <laughs> That's just how I'm wired. Uh, there are some details there up top, so I'm adding those in, including some reds and blues. That's just how I'm wired. I like to see every primary color in my paintings. I don't mind if there isn't a green, if there isn't a purple, if there isn't any color can be missing. I do, however, like it when I have all three primary colors. Just me. Uh, bottom of the painting, not really important. I'm going to cover it real fast. Um, generally speaking, I'm trying to use a lot of means to capture the attention in the center of the painting or the focal point if I can. Uh, I just find that it looks more interesting. Um, and yeah, just strengthening some of the shapes here. This is really final touches because I felt like I could even add more. Here's that red I told you about. I felt like I could add more areas to, for our eyes to focus on. I uh, really, really like how this red turned out. I'll probably lift some of it just so that it doesn't go too dark. Uh, but even that cast shadow, I think it, it adds a bit of interest to the entirety of the building. Uh, something that I was missing a bit. Uh, so yeah, I think we can conclude adding a few touches with white gel pen. We talked about leaving the white of the paper. We talked about vibrant colors, especially in the first wash. We talked about a gentle color variety within the shadows. Then we had a bonus tip. Um, don't forget to go as dark as necessary. And another one, check out the overall composition. Here is the final result. If I did darken the sky, I'm going to show you hopefully a side by side of that too. Um, I hope that was useful. This was, uh, again, for me to test the ground, see if there is a point in painting a larger painting. There definitely is. I think this will work out to be a very good um, large painting. It's very similar to my corner office painting. If you've seen that one, I'll put it up on the screen probably as well. I do want to thank take this opportunity to thank you so so much for supporting me and my work don't forget you can support me via patreon if you want to receive credits at the end of the videos that's how you do it um we'll put a link below if you want to check out the watercolor course we'll link those down below as well frustration free watercolor course and watercolor realism course if you're more into that and lastly the drawing course as well if you want to improve your drawing skills, you can check it out. You can also check uh, out the book on Amazon, How to Sketch, my best seller, my best selling book as well. Um, check it out uh, if you prefer a book format or I think it's a good gift, you know, physical book. Uh, thank you so, so much. We'll see you in the next video. Until next time, take care.